photo mosaics are a very interesting form of art media. Maybe you've seen some of these. I think we even have a couple around our church. There are pictures where if you stand back and you look at the picture as a whole, you see a face, right? But as you get in closer, as I tried to sort of show you over there, as you get in closer, you see there's lots of smaller pictures, right? One big picture made up of smaller ones. The scripture, God's word, is sort of like this. All of scripture points to God's wonderful and glorious gospel. And inside are all of these smaller accounts that do the same thing. When we come to one of those accounts of the gospel, according to Mark, we find the same thing again. The whole book is written for one purpose. Each week we could make the same application. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, who repent and believe. But as we get into the smaller accounts, not only do they point to the big picture, but they also have other lessons for us as well. And through thinking through these, praying through these, there are four of these lessons that we're going to put together, the first four stories in Mark chapter 8. Because I think as we put them together, we will see not only that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and we ought to repent and believe in his name, but also a very specific application that applies to us today. Now, normally, if you, if you keep track of how I preach, I normally like to try to save, like, the punchline for the end, okay? Here's all these things. What does it mean for us? Boom. Today, I think, for clarity's sake, I'm going to do it backwards, okay? I'm going to tell you up front the application, then you can all go to sleep. No. <laughs> I'll tell you the application up front because I think, and then I'll explain to you how I get there. And then we'll look at the pieces to say, okay, now I understand it, and then we'll come back around and really apply this text and talk about it more. So if we think about the application, the punchline, so to speak, the witty line that, you know, as a preacher you're trying to put together, James said it better than I could, so I just stole what James said. And that is, faith without works is dead. In our text today, we're going to see the call for faith, but I think we're also going to see the call for works. And so as we get to the end, we will talk about faith without works is dead and how this text does that. Now, I tried to sort of graphically portray this to you in a picture here. This is how my brain works as I was trying to work through these texts and put them together. I scribbled all sorts of different things and, okay, this, how do these stories fit together? And so I thought I would share with you my result. This is how I get to faith without works is dead, and we'll talk about it briefly here. Our first story and our last story, they are both miracle accounts. Any miracle in Scripture has primarily one function, to show that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Okay? Everything Jesus does, and these are no different. They stress that Jesus is the Christ, his divine power. But what sort of stands these two apart is we also see his compassion towards those who have physical needs specifically in these two accounts, and exponentially screaming out in the first one. In the middle of these two accounts, we call them, may call them bookends, we have conversations. First Jesus' conversation with the Pharisees, and then his conversation with the disciples. And in these, he calls them to have faith. Have faith that he is the Christ, the Son of God. So understanding these pieces together, we're going to look at first the miracle accounts and also then the responses. And I believe we will see as we work through these texts the importance of faith, but not just faith in Christ that is no works, but rather faith in Christ that has works. And following the example of Christ in the two miracle accounts, the specific application we'll talk about is works among others, sharing Christ's love, and even more specifically, how we help each other in the middle of this virus outbreak we have. So let's begin here. Let's look at the first one of these miracle passages. This is the feeding of the 4,000. Um, in, your, in your handout, in your bulletin, you will find that Bible text. You are welcome to use it there. There's a Bible in front of you, or if you have your own, um, my I would encourage you, pull out your own Bible read from your own Bible. We're going to start by looking at the feeding of the 4,000. 
Let's go ahead and just read these first ten verses. In those days there was another large crowd with nothing to eat, so Jesus called his disciples and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd, because they have already been here with me three days, and they have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come from a great distance. His disciples answered him, Where can someone get enough bread in this desolate place to satisfy these people? Sounds like the shelves of Walmart right now, right? He asked them, verse 5, How many loaves do you have? They replied, Seven. Then he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. After he took the seven loaves and gave thanks, he broke them and began to giving thanks to the disciples to serve. So they served the crowd, verse 7. They also had a few small fish, and after giving thanks for these, he told them to serve these as well. Everyone ate and was satisfied, and they picked up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. There were about 4,000 who ate. Then he dismissed them, immediately got into a boat with his disciples, and they went to the district of Dalmanutha. There are some people who hold to this text as a retelling of the feeding of the 5,000. However, there are so many differences between these two, and ultimately, as we're going to continue to read, Jesus cites both accounts as being distinct. So I see no reason to view these as one and the same, but rather two unique miracle feeding accounts. The primary difference between these two is the issue of compassion, why Jesus is acting. If you recall with me from when uh, Pastor Nathan preached chapter 6, the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus has compassion on the people, but do you remember why he has compassion? Anyone remember? Pop quiz, right? I always, I always hate when that happens. Uh, he has compassion because they are like sheep without a shepherd. They have no spiritual leadership, so he preaches to them, and then the disciples come to him and say, hey, these people are hungry, send them away. Jesus says, no, you feed them, and then we get the feeding account. So in that text, what is primarily driving Jesus is their spiritual needs. And it's the disciples themselves who initiate sort of the, he the healing, excuse me, the feeding miracle by them coming to Jesus. Feeding of the 4,000 is different. Notice there, verse 2, I have compassion on the crowd because they have already been here with me three days and they have nothing to eat. Here Jesus has compassion because they have a physical need. They have, he has compassion because they are hungry. They haven't eaten. They've been with him three days. I'm not sure why. Maybe some of them came and went. Maybe they were there the whole time. Later on, remember if you, when we read, it talked about someone having some fish. Perhaps they came with food, ate up their resources, but Jesus' preaching was so great, they still stuck around. You know, an interesting thought that I had was, um, how many of us would want to go to a desolate place and listen to preaching for three days straight? <laughs> hmm. But these people do. Jesus is there. And Jesus, he has compassion on them after three days. Now, I don't know about you, but Jesus is probably hungry. And my wife can attest to this. One of the areas that I still have room to grow is sometimes when I am hungry, I can be less than compassionate towards others. I just need a Snickers bar, right? My, I'm hungry. What is it? Hangry, they think they call it, right? You're, you're hungry and so you're just cranky, right? Maybe some of you are, get like that too. When you're hungry, you're just cranky, okay? Jesus isn't. He's compassionate. It's been three days. Instead of thinking about how hungry he might be, he's looking out and seeing how physically hungry the others are. He is moved with compassion. So he calls for bread. Is there any bread? The disciples are clueless, a theme that we're going to see as we continue to read. They are dull of mind, okay? Very dull as we work through Mark. In fact, uh, Mark's gospel is perhaps one of the ones that paints them the dullest of all gospels. They find they have some bread. Jesus prays over it. They feed. Later, they find they have some fish. Perhaps someone who was hoarding his secret stash saw the bread being spread around and decided to help give. 
It's sort of like um, those last Valentine's Day chocolates. I think I snuck the last one a couple days ago and ate it at our house. Okay, I think all the Valentine's Day chocolate is finally gone. Perhaps this person had a couple, one fish, and he was holding on to it, and now seeing the compassion of others, he is acting in compassion, and Jesus is able to multiply that out. We find at the end, everyone eats, they're satisfied, there is plenty of leftovers available. Jesus has compassion, he reaches out, there is plenty of leftovers for everyone. Jesus is the divine son of God, he has the power to take one and multiply it to feed 4,000. He has the ability to take a single gift and make it greater than what anyone else can do. I can only do so little. And God just laughs and says, yeah, but I can do so much with that. Because he is the divine son of God, but we also see he is the compassionate son of God who sees physical needs, who recognizes physical needs, and chooses to act to help those with physical needs. Let's go ahead and look now at the second miracle story. It says basically the same thing, but in a little different of a way. It's now the very end of our text, chapter verses 22 through 26, the second bookend, the other miracle story. Now, before I read it, I do need to give you just a little bit of context, okay? Um, if you look at verse 22, it says they came to Bethsaida, okay? Bethsaida is, if you visit, if you think of the Sea of Galilee, it is on the northwest side of the city. It is in an area where Jesus has done a lot of miracles, It is in Galilee, and Jesus spent the first part of his ministry up there. Unfortunately, a lot of people rejected him. In fact, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 21, we find these words. Woe to you, Bethsaida, for the miracles, for if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they have repented long ago. But I tell you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than you. Jesus has done miracles over and over in the Galilee area, and several of these cities, he basically says, woe to you. (laughs) You have reaped eternal judgment because you have seen the Son of God in action and rejected him. This miracle coming up is the last one that occurs in this area. Jesus is preparing to leave, and in Matthew's text, he has already proclaimed judgment upon these cities. So now let's go to verse 22 and read. Then they came to Bethsaida. They brought a blind man to Jesus and asked him to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and brought him outside of the village. Then he spit on his eyes and placed his hands on his eyes and asked, Do you see? Do you see anything? Regaining his sight, he said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. So Jesus is coming through. This is his last stop here in Bethsaida. Bethsaida, according to John, is the home, John 1.14. This is the home of Peter and Andrew as well as Philip. He is coming through there. He is not, in the Gospel of Mark, going to be back in this city. He is going to go a little bit up into Gentile country, and then after that he is basically beginning his ministry towards Jerusalem. But as he is there, some folks convince him to do one more miracle, to do one more to help this man who is blind. Jesus takes him out of the city, perhaps to make it more intimate, but also perhaps almost in judgment to the city. You have rejected me. You're not going to get to see this miracle. But he takes him outside, and he decides, I'm going to do— Oh, there it is. I had a map. Look at that. That's where Bethsaida is. I'm going to take you out, and I'm going to help one more person. I'm going to help one more person. Jesus has compassion again on this guy. He knows these people have no faith. He doesn't need to perform a miracle. He has done enough. But Jesus, please help. Jesus, please help. And Jesus goes, yes. 
I will do this last miracle as an act of compassion. Now, the, the miracle itself is actually a very, very odd one. It is one of the ones unique to Mark's gospel. There are two miracles in Mark's gospel that only Mark records. There is the healing of a deaf man, and there is a healing of a blind man that are only found in Mark, and this is one of those, okay? And not only is it unique in that regard, but it's also unique because Jesus asked that question in the middle, and it seems like at first it doesn't work. Jesus touches him, and then he doesn't seem to get better, like sort of, but then doesn't, and well, was Jesus not powerful enough? There's a lot of speculation because Mark doesn't tell us why. I think the best speculation as to why there is a two-part healing here is it is almost prophetic of the disciples. They are very, very dull <laughs> at the beginning of Mark chapter 8. At the end of Mark chapter 8, it seems like now they are finally starting to get it. And then you have the whole Jesus, Peter saying to Jesus, you can't go and do all these things. And Jesus says, no, get behind me, Satan. And we see then again a continuing lack of faith on the disciples through the whole book of Mark. So the best speculation as to what is happening is perhaps Mark is using this story to reveal to us and show us just how difficult it was for the disciples to get who Jesus is. As a thought that I had when I was originally trying to organize this text, um, I find it very interesting. As we'll see in a minute, the Pharisees did not know who Jesus was. They couldn't, didn't have the eyes and the faith to see who he was. The disciples don't have the faith and the eyes to see who Jesus is. And who sees? The blind man. <laughs> okay, it's an interesting play as you work through the beginning of Mark chapter 8. But Jesus has compassion. He does this healing. He touches him. Um, we're not supposed to do that now. Coronavirus, please don't try to do touching, right? But Jesus does. Um, there is thought that the spit was thought as medicinal in this time. We know it's not now, so don't try that, okay? Uh, but he touches, he's healing, he has compassion, and ultimately Jesus restores his eyesight perfectly. Why? Because he decides, I'm going to heal this one more person this week one last guy. I have compassion. I can do this. I can help him. This will change his whole life. Let me do this out of compassion. So both miracle stories, as we look at them, the bookends of our text today, both of them remind us of the divinity of Christ, his power over nature. He can multiply the fish. He can make the blind to see. But they also remind us of his great compassion for his people. Hunger. Blindness. Jesus is moved to help those who are around him. Now, we're going to go up and let's talk about Jesus' conversation. Actually, real fast, look at verse 26. Jesus sent him home saying, do not even go into the village. Again, I think this is an act of judgment on the city. They've rejected him. Jesus says, don't even show them. They don't need to see. They have already seen enough. Let's go now up to those conversations, the conversations that Jesus has in the middle here, first with the Pharisees in verses 11 through 13. Then the Pharisees came and began to argue with Jesus, asking for a sign from heaven to test him. Sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, why does this generation look for a sign? I tell you the truth, no sign will be given to this generation. Then he left them and got into the boat and went to the other side. The Pharisees come, they are hostile to Jesus. Remember, from several, several chapters back, they are now plotting how they can get to him. And so when it says arguing, they're not trying to like play devil advocate for fun. But the fact that Mark uses the phrase here, arguing and testing and what they're acting for, it's almost as if they are agents of Satan. They are not trying to ask for another miracle so they can go, do you know what? I said if you would do 12, I would believe, and you're up to 11. So do one more and I'll believe. Instead, what I think they're up to doing is they're trying to say, okay, give us this miracle. 
he's not going to be able to do it, and then we'll be able to show everyone he's a fake. So this is a, not a request because of faith. This is a trap trying to get him to do something or not be able to do something, which Jesus could do whatever he wanted. It is interesting, the word that's used for sign, the New English translation describes it or translates it, sign from heaven. Um, there's a particular reason for that. The Greek word here is different than the regular word for sign. You know, Jesus did this, Jesus did that, miracle, healing. This is a slightly different word, and it implies something bigger. How can you get bigger than healing a blind man? The only examples I could think of is the crossing of the Red Sea, maybe, a physical act in nature. Um, the other one I thought of is the fire from heaven with Elijah, right? So the, the Pharisees are not asking for what he's already doing. They're looking for this massive blockbuster. The whole world is upside down. The clock is changing. There's fire from heaven. The oceans are dividing. And God in heaven is proclaiming loudly, this is my divine son. They're like, that's what we want. He's not going to do it. He can't do it. And Jesus is like, no, I'm not even playing this game with you. He sighs deeply in his spirit, that groaning. Maybe some of you know somebody who is continuing to make super foolish decisions. And after the umpteenth millionth time, they pick up the phone and tell you they're doing it again. And you go, ugh. Jesus sighs. He's like, oh my, these people. They do not believe. Their sin had hardened their hearts. Their sin had hardened their hearts. Romans 3 talks about how terrible sin is. Sin makes us so that no one understands, no one seeks God, no one turns to God. Instead, we all reject God. The Pharisees have no faith. They do not want to believe. And so Jesus leaves. He doesn't perform a miracle. We mentioned this in my Sunday school class this morning. What I think Jesus is basically doing here is turning them over to their unbelief. Romans 1 says that, Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. He starts out there and says, hey, the lost see that there must be some sort of glorious God. How else could you describe what you see, how you even come into existence, the birth of a new baby? The only explanation is that there is someone great. But because of their sin, they suppress the truth. I don't want to know. I don't care about God. I'm not interested in God. It continues in chapter 1 and verse 24 says this, Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their heart. God says, you don't want me. I have the gospel. You don't want that? Okay. Go and chase your sin. Pursue your sin. Enjoy your sin. And I'll meet you at the final judgment. You might think you're not going to be there, but I will be there. Go ahead. Do the sin that you want to do. I won't try to stop you anymore. I think Jesus has that mindset here with the Pharisees. I have done all these miracles. You don't care. You are testing me to try to get me to fail, to try to not accomplish this. Go ahead in your unbelief. Go ahead in your unbelief. I'm not, I'm done with you. I'll see you with the final judgment. Maybe he thinks to himself. They have so hardened their hearts. Sin has so controlled them that they are testing him not because they want to be saved or to believe, but because they want another reason to reject him. And so Jesus walks away. And after that occurs, we, the text continues into the disciples. So the Pharisees have no faith. They have completely rejected Jesus. But yet the disciples, though they are following Jesus, are dull. <laughs> right? Let's keep reading. Verse 14. Now they, so this is the disciples, had forgotten to take bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. 
This is sort of like a, let me tell you something extra to help you understand the story. It's like a preface in a book, a background to a story, and that is they're in the boat again, okay? So we have a lot of boat stuff in the account. Jesus talks to the Pharisees. Well, he feeds the 4,000. He gets in a boat. They go over. They meet the Pharisees. They get in a boat, okay? Now they're in the boat, and they only have one loaf of bread. For some reason, they had seven full baskets, and they only have one loaf of bread, okay? So that is the background. Verse 15. And Jesus ordered them, watch out! Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. So they began to discuss with one another about having no bread. When he learned of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you arguing about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Have your hearts been hardened? Though you have eyes, don't you see? And though you have ears, can't you hear? Don't you remember? When I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They replied, Twelve. When I broke the seven loaves for the four thousand, how many baskets full of pieces did you pick up? And they replied, Seven. Then he said to them, Do you still not understand? Now this text can be confusing, and in fact, we can all read it and go, I don't understand. <laughs> What's happening here? Let me try to explain that to you. So remember, there's only one loaf of bread on the boat. It's like an arbitrary fact that you just need to know for this story. So Jesus in verse 15, watch out, beware of the yeast, okay? Again, a lot of discussion. What exactly is he talking about here? I think in context, what Jesus is talking about is the Pharisees' hardness of heart. This text comes exactly after this encounter with the Pharisees. They're in the boat. The Pharisees have rejected, and Herod too had done this. And the, so they're in the boat, and Jesus said, don't reject me like they have. Have faith. Don't test me and say, it was he really God's son. Believe who I am. Their yeast, it was always viewed as evil. He says, beware of that. Watch out for their hardness of heart, their lack of faith. Don't allow it to corrupt you. If you have some bread with yeast in it, and you put it with some bread that doesn't have yeast, and you put them together, guess what you have? Bread that has yeast. It goes across. It transfers over. Be careful. Don't allow their hardness and their lack of faith to influence you. So that's what Jesus is trying to warn them of, and remember, we've said the disciples are dull. They miss it, <laughs> right? And so the disciples say, they start talking. Hey, he's talking about bread. Did you bring the bread? No, you were supposed to bring the bread. No, you— you, you why, why did we not bring the bread? Whose fault is it? Peter, it's your fault. No, no, no. Whose fault is it? We don't have bread. And Jesus is going, come on, guys. <laughs> come on. Remember that arbitrary fact? There's one piece of bread in the boat. The disciples miss it. They're dull. They don't have the faith to truly understand what Jesus is trying to say. Now, Jesus' response, again, can be a little confusing here. Jesus goes back to, okay, do you not see? Do you not understand? Remember, I did all these miracles. And that seems like a really weird response. Well, Jesus, why don't you just say to them, okay, hold on, I was trying to warn you about the hardness of heart of the Pharisees. That seems like a logical response. Why didn't Jesus say, look at them and say, just be quiet? At least then it would stop fighting. Why this response reminding them of the miracles? Here's the answer. Jesus is trying to encourage them, guys, I'm talking to you about faith. Faith in who I am. Don't you remember what you saw? I'm warning you about faith, and here are all the miracles I did. Don't you understand they were to try to tell you I am the divine Son of God? He's trying to tell them, okay, have faith. You are not recognizing who I am. Ultimately, that's what is happening here. The disciples, they don't get it. They don't recognize who he is. And so Jesus is trying to say, hold on, guys. 
remember the miracles. They point to who I am. Don't reject me like the Pharisees. Instead, have faith. The disciples completely misunderstood what Jesus was saying. He was trying to jog their memory of when he displayed that he is the divine son and trying to call them into saving faith. So when we consider these two conversations, we can say this about them. Both conversations remind us of the need for everyone to recognize who Jesus is and to trust in him or place their faith in him. Jesus sees the hardness of the Pharisees. He, it moves him. He is distraught. He leaves them. He's trying to get the disciples to really understand him, to place their faith in him, to believe in him, and to not be like the Pharisees. Okay. So understanding now, we have two miracle accounts. They both point to the fact that Jesus is the divine Son of God, and that even as the divine Son of God, he is compassionate. And our middle conversation accounts remind us that we are supposed to have faith that he is the divine Son of God and not reject him. As we put these pieces together, let us have faith with works. Or let's go to the book of James. It's up here. You can go into your Bible because James says it so brilliantly as he puts together the concept of having great faith in who Christ is and the concept of being like the one, having compassion. James 2, 14 to 17. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Can this kind of faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacks daily food, sort of like the 4,000, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, eat well. But you do not give them what the body needs. What good is it? So also faith, if it does not have works, is dead, being by itself. James, as well as Jesus, is trying to remind us of two things. First, do you have faith? Do you have saving faith? in the Messiah? Do you have eyes to see and ears to see here about who he is? The one who can feed 4,000 from a couple fish and bread. The one who can heal the blind, just as the prophet Isaiah said hundreds of years beforehand. Do you have faith? Or are you like the Pharisees who hear and see and say, no, thank you? James calls us to have faith. Jesus calls us to have faith, to believe that he is the divine Son of God, to believe in the gospel. Today, if you are not familiar with the gospel, the gospel is the story that we are all sinners and we cannot get to heaven by ourselves. God's standard to get into heaven, you know, like you might apply for college and they say you have to have a certain ACT or SAT score God says there's a certain score to get into heaven, and it is perfect. And y'all, including myself, fail. In fact, you even were talking in our Sunday school class again. If you say, well, I'm perfect at this. James, in his book, says, well, when you break this law, you're breaking all of them. <laughs> They're all connected. The gospel says we are sinners. We cannot be good enough to get into heaven the best we can muster is worthlessness. But God knew that and sent the divine Son, Jesus. Jesus lived perfectly, never sinned, and then Jesus died in our place. And if we will have faith, if we will trust, if we will believe, if we will have confidence in him, those are all synonyms, if we will do that, then we will be saved. If we will trust that Christ died on our behalf and rose again, God says, I will forgive your sins and I will bring you to the home I have prepared for you. If you do not and have never trusted the gospel, I'd love to talk to you afterwards 
or Pastor Nathan would love to talk to you afterwards because those who have the gospel do not need to fear and do not need to panic. Our great God has a home prepared for us. He controls everything, and he loves us. And so the world, what they need is the gospel. As we already mentioned, you're going to have opportunities in the grocery store, at work, to talk to folks who have fear and who have panic. Share with them the gospel. The gospel is the answer that brings peace and hope and joy in every circumstance. Do you have faith, Jesus and James say? But even more than that, do you have works? Does that faith produce works? As Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, God has prepared good works for us so that we'll do them. James says in his text here, you see somebody hungry and you say, I have saving faith, but you don't try to help them? No, saving faith has action to it. Saving faith produces good works. Now, originally, I was planning to plug Rowan Helping Ministries. You see in your bulletin, we're trying to get over there to help them. Here's a great opportunity for you to do that. At this moment, we are still planning on that. We have not heard from them that we're not doing it. We are still planning on going. So, if you say you have faith, let us do some works as a result of our faith, and here is a great opportunity. Jesus saw the 4,000. He saw that they were physically hungry. Here, in James, he uses the idea of hunger. Lacks daily food. We have folks who lack daily food. As we go to Rohan Helping Ministries, we will be able to help meet those needs. And so I would encourage you, even at this point, if you're able to come, please sign up. I'm pretty sure we'll have them, but we can't guarantee anything at this point. <laughs> We'll let you know if that changes. But faith without works is dead. We, our faith ought to produce good works in us. Now, if you notice there at the very bottom, I had words of wisdom about helping those in need. Oftentimes, we can talk in very abstract terms, and I thought maybe I would try to share some wisdom on some more specific answers that people might encounter words of wisdom. The first one of those comes from Proverbs 11.25. Proverbs 11.25 says this, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. As you give and help, your soul is renewed. Proverbs says, generously help those who have physical needs. Again, we're looking to do that with Rowan Helping Ministries, and you will probably have opportunities with neighbors or Facebook people or others coming across your path this week. Take those opportunities. Put your faith to work by helping them. Okay? Does that mean, because here's one of those practical questions, help generously, right? Does that mean you need to give away every roll of toilet paper that you have? Okay? That's a real question we need to ask ourselves right now, right? Do I have to give away everything? Well, wisdom tells us to balance two things. Generosity and also being wise stewards. For example, the ant. Proverbs 6, right? Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its har food at harvest. The ant gets prepared for the winter. Over and over again, we see it in the book of Proverbs. Be wise. Prepare for what will come. Don't be lazy, but think ahead. And so preparing and being wise must come together, and wisdom is where they join together going maybe, I have more than what I need. Let me be generous. Or sometimes going, I've got six of us at home and I've got two roles. Perhaps I might take care of those who are already in my home first. Wisdom puts those two pieces together. Wisdom and prayer allows us to both be generous and at the same time go, okay, I must be wise for what comes ahead. 
Another specific question that might come into play now, and this was something I was thinking about even last night, should I put myself at risk in order to be generous at others? That is a question you might actually have to ask yourselves in a couple of weeks. I don't know. Hopefully we won't. Perhaps you will. Again, wisdom comes into play. If you are a primary caretaker of someone who has a physical need, Scripture tells us, take care of those who are inside your family. We have an obligation to take care of those who are dependent on us, and so wisdom dictates if you are a caregiver of somebody, you ought to probably not put yourself in a position where you will not be able to help those who are under your care. Wisdom also encourages us to have faith, but wisdom encourages us to put these pieces together and to discern. And the beauty about wisdom is it's individual. Your situation will be different than mine. Mine will be different than yours. Our situations are all unique to each other. But wisdom tells us, okay, those who God has given to you to take care of, make sure you are doing that. Also, be generous. Be generous and help those who you can help. And wisdom says, if you pursue me, I'll tell you where that balance is. How you can both be generous and take care of those who are around us. So do we need to give away every last roll of toilet paper? Well, we ourselves are alive, and we need to make sure that we are not going to be dependent on someone else. I think that could be a good test. Okay, well, do I have what I need, or if I give this away, am I going to have to go call my friend up for something? Okay, or are you completing the cycle, or are you ending the cycle of dependency? Okay, do I put myself at risk to help others? A good question is, is if I do get it, Will that hurt those who are closest to me and my ability to take care of those who are around me? I think scripture commands us that we are to take care of those, specifically, especially our biological family, secondly, our spiritual family, and so we need to be careful that we don't put ourselves into so much risk that we ourselves are then dependent on others. And so wisdom and prudence will allow us to make those decisions, and those come case by case. I can't tell you what exactly is best for each one of you. If you want to talk it to Nathan or I about it, we'd love to sit down and say, okay, well, let's evaluate with wisdom your specific situation. But from the pulpit, I can't make this huge blanket statement except to say wisdom calls us to be generous and wisdom calls us to be wise and to be prepared. And ultimately, we must put those two pieces together as we decide to be generous and how we do that. So we need to help those who have physical needs. We are also to instruct those who are foolish. If you have somebody who has a pet cat and they keep chewing up their toilet paper, I would say wisdom might not say to you, keep giving them toilet paper, okay? If they are not wise enough to put it in a place where the cat can't chew it, you, might should, you probably should be wise enough not to keep giving them <laughs> so the cat doesn't keep chewing it, right? Those who are foolish need instruction from those who are wise. Proverbs 13, whoever disregards discipline comes to poverty. Those who reject wisdom will come to foolishness and destruction. Those who are not wise will face more difficulties. And so what we need to do is to be generous and to help them, but ultimately to try to give them and help them understand wisdom. Don't just give to help people with their physical needs. Seek to impart wisdom into their life so that they can also make wise decisions. Now, as I mentioned, I think if you're talking to someone and they are going to continue to be the fool, they are going to refuse to do things, and as you continue to give to them, they are continually being the fool over and over and over and over again. There is a point where we say, okay, now I am the fool I thought this text was very helpful. Now, there are some times when real love dictates that we withhold giving, and the more intimate we are involved in a person's life, the better we can discern this. If you want to know where that line is, then you really need to know that person. You need to talk to them. You need to be trying to impart wisdom into their life. Only those who you really know can you really try to begin to understand but our first response should be to give generously 
and as we are giving, we should be trying to instruct those who are foolish, instruct them in wisdom. The third group is actually somewhat specific, and that is to reject those who are idle. The text in 2 Thessalonians is specifically for Christians, okay? As Christians, we are supposed to be wise. We are supposed to be diligent. We are supposed to be preparing so that as we prepare, we can give generously from what we have prepared. But here in 2 Thessalonians, we have those who are not working and just want to receive. Paul says, if you don't work, you're not going to (laughs) eat. He's specifically talking to Christians here again. A Christian who says, I profess the name of Christ, but yet I'm too lazy to go and do what is necessary. I am too lazy to practice wisdom myself and just keep wanting handouts. He says, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6, In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive. We ought to warn each other if we see one of us falling into this category. So far, I know of none in our church, but we ought to not be lazy, but be diligent in providing for our families, diligent in pursuing the wise provision of goods, but also generous in handing those out to those in need. But lastly, and possibly most important in everything that we do, point to what's eternal. I picked here for your, here, John, John 6, 35, because we've talked a lot about bread today, right? Jesus in the boat, bread, the feeding of the 4,000 bread. Now we have some food issues that we're trying to uncover. You might think of that as bread, so to speak. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The greatest thing you can do, even greater than taking bananas or chicken to your neighbor, the greatest thing you can do is to take the gospel. And if you take those items to your neighbor, which you ought to do generously and wisely, if you do not take the gospel with you, then you are missing the most important thing. In this time that we have right now where everyone is panicking and everyone is freaking out and some of your friends and neighbors might be lacking in certain essentials, if you have that, we should be generous, we should be helping, we should be compassionate, we should be wise and prudent, but most importantly, we need to share the true bread, the bread that leaves you full and never needing any more, and that's our Savior. We ought to share the gospel with those around us. We ought to share with them that they don't need to have fear, but they can have faith. That they don't need to panic, but can have peace through Jesus Christ. And so this is a wonderful time. You know, I I enjoyed snowstorms up north, because when you have a snowstorm, you're out, and your neighbor is out, and you get to talk to them. Well, now you and your neighbor might both be looking at each other going, we can't go to work. Guess what? You can talk to them about Jesus. <laughs> your neighbors comes over and knocks on your door. We're out of toilet paper. And you're like, let me share some with you. And do you know what? I'm not too worried. Let me, I'd love to give this to you. You know, do you know Jesus at all? Jesus who? Huh, let me tell you. This is a great opportunity that we have to share Christ to not only meet physical needs, but to go beyond that and to help people realize their spiritual need, and we need to do that. So as we look at these accounts here, we see Jesus, the divine Son of God. We are called to have faith, to believe in who he is, to respond to the gospel in saving faith. But as we look at our great Savior and what he did, it also calls us to act like him, to be compassionate like him, to be generous like him. And so as we look to summarize these verses, the beginning part of Mark 8, as we look to put them together into that one sort of, okay, I can remember one thing, because I have a brain that can only remember one thing, okay? And so if I can give you one thing as you look at the beginning of Mark 8, and I think it applies to what we're going to go out to as we leave from here, James put it right. James put it right. Faith without works is dead. Have faith. Share your faith. And this is a great week to put your faith to work. 
share the love of Christ to others, share the need, the true bread, the living water that fully satisfies the one who can bring peace, joy, hope in every circumstance, as Paul says at the end of 2 Thessalonians, in every condition, (laughs) it's Christ. Let's go share Christ as we meet the needs of those that we are able to meet. Let us pray.